Section 28 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Ware. Section 28. The Law on Cat Killing. An articled clerk writing to the standard with regard to the illegality of killing cats states, it is clearly laid down in Addison on Torts that a person is not justified in killing his neighbor's cat or dog, which he finds on his land, unless the animal is in the act of doing some injurious act which can only be prevented by its slaughter. And it has been decided by the case of Townsend v. Watkin, 9, last 277, that if a person sets on his land a trap for foxes, and baits it with such strong-smelling meat as to attract his neighbor's dog or cat onto his land, to the trap, and such animals thereby killed or injured, he is liable for the act, though he had no intention of doing it, and though the animal ought not to have been on his land. Dead Cats Lifeless cats have been from time immemorial suggestive of foolish hoaxing, a parcel being made up, or a basket with the legs of a hare projecting, directed to someone at a distance, and on which the charge for carriage comes to a considerable sum, the fortunate recipient ultimately to his great annoyance finding his present was nothing else but a dead cat dead cats which not infrequently were cast into the streets or accidentally killed there were sometimes used as objects of sport by the silly low-minded and vulgar and it was thought a clever thing if they could deposit such in a drawing-room through an open window or pitch the unfortunate animal often crushed and dirty into a passing carriage but the time of times when it was considered to be a legitimate object to use was that of either a borough or county election cats and rotten eggs forming the material with which the assault was conducted in the event of an unpopular candidate for honours attempting to give his political views to a deprecatory mob surrounding the hustings an anecdote is recorded in gross's olio of mr fox who in seventeen eighty four was a candidate for westminster which goes far to show what dirty, degrading, disgusting indignities the would-be people's representative had to endure at that period, and with what good humor such favors of popular appreciation or otherwise were received. During the poll a dead cat being thrown on the hustings, one of Sir Cecil Ray's party observed it stunk worse than a fox, to which Mr. Fox replied there was nothing extraordinary in that, considering it was a poll cat. This is by no means the only ready and witty answer that has been attributed to Mr. Fox, though not bearing on the present subject. The Cat as a Tormentor Shakespeare in Lucretia says, Yet foul night-waking cat, he doth but dally, while in his holdfast foot the weak mouse panteth. In an essay on the art of ingeniously tormenting, 1753, the cat is alluded to in the frontspiece, a cat at play with a mouse, below which is the couplet, The cat doth play, and after slay. Child's Guide Giovanni Battista Casti, in his book Tre Giuli, 1762, likens the cat to one who lends money and suddenly pounces on the debtor. Thus sometimes with a mouse and nip the cat will on her hapless victim smile, until at length she gives the fatal grip. Again John Phillips, in the latter part of the seventeenth century, in his poem of the splendid shilling referring to debtors writes grimalkin to domestic vermin sworn in everlasting foe with watchful eye lies nightly brooding o'er a chinky gap pretending her fell claws to thoughtless mice sure ruin heraldry etc a cat hieroglyphically represents false friendship or a deceitful flattering friend the cat in heraldry is an emblem of liberty because it naturally dislikes to be shut up and therefore the Burgundians, etc., bore a cat on their banners to intimate that they could not endure servitude. It is a bold and daring creature, and also cruel to its enemy, and never gives over till it has destroyed it, if possible. It is also watchful, dexterous, swift, pliable, and has good nerves. Thus, if it falls from a place never so high, it still alights on its feet, and therefore may denote those who have much forethought, that whatsoever befalls them, they are still on their guard. In coat armor they must always be represented as full-faced, and not showing one side of it, but both their eyes and both their ears. Argent, Three Cats in Pale, 
Sable is the coat of the family of Keat of Devonshire. Many families have adopted the cat as their emblem. In cats past and present, several are noted. In Scotland, the clan Chatton bore as their chief cognizance the wild cat, and called their chief Moor en Chat, the great wild cat. Nor is the name uncommon as an English surname, frequently appearing as C-A-T, cat, C-A-T-T, cat, C-A-T-T-E, cat. But the most strange association of the name with the calling was one I knew in my old sporting days of a gamekeeper whose name was Cat. End of section 28